again Don't know when Don't know when The Pacific Theater of World War II Millions of young Allied men board warships and storm into the vast ocean in order to face the Japanese Emperor's forces. For nearly half a decade, these civilizationally opposed forces warred with each other in the most ferocious naval battles the world has ever seen. By 1945, civilian and military casualty counts numbered in the tens of millions. Despite the exhausting efforts and gratuitous loss of life, the Pacific Theater has at least one less than tragic story to tell. The peculiar story of how young men stationed in tropical locations were able to find freedom amidst heavy regimentation, escapism amidst a grim reality, and laddishness amidst hellishness. Perhaps the most notable in this regard are the American seamen stationed in locations such as the Hawaiian Islands and Bora Bora. Many of the young men stationed in locations such as these did not take for granted the natural beauty surrounding them and the exotic mystery of the indigenous islanders. The ambiguities of being militarily stationed in paradise are difficult to reconcile, but the spirit of these naval adventures were captured well by Lieutenant Commander James A. Mishner in his Pulcher Prize award-winning Tales of the South Pacific. The tales tell a series of short stories largely based upon Mishner's own observations while stationed on the island nation now known as Vanuatu. The book was adapted into the musical South Pacific in 1949 and remains the second longest running Broadway musical of all time. It was also adapted to the silver screen in 1959. The film bearing the same name earned three Academy Award nominations and won one. Though the South Pacific Enterprise was instrumental in developing America's fascination with the exotic Pacific, Mishner was not the only man with an intrepid nautical tale to tell. In 1947, a team of Norwegian explorers headed by ethnographer Tor Hederall sailed a raft from South America to Polynesia in order to demonstrate the plausibility of South Americans first settling Polynesia. Though any conclusions drawn from this expedition remain controversial, Hederall's experiment was enough to capture the public's imagination and his journey was also adapted into a best-selling book and an Academy Award-winning film. By the mid-20th century, the world was captivated by the allure of Pacific Islands, but none more so than Americans, who brought the so-called tiki culture into full hedonistic swing. Quick aside, if you're watching this, you have probably heard the word tiki before. Just to give a little background information, the word tiki is most likely a misappropriation of several elements of South American and Pacific mythology. Regardless of its nominal origins, the new tiki culture was the answer to America's post-war desire for escapism and fantasy. American consumers wanted to visit an affordable Garden of Eden for a few hours at a time, and many entrepreneurs began constructing little versions of paradise. Particularly, the restaurant industry played a crucial role in the tiki craze. Chinese-style dishes with faux Hawaiian names and colorful, highly alcoholic drinks became the wine and manna of these manufactured Edens. New island-themed music, like that of Martin Denny, even began climbing the charts. By the mid-1950s, tiki culture was widespread. Allured by the approachable hedonism, light sexuality, and contrived escapism of the tiki theme, Americans luau'd and beach-bummed well into the 1960s. With Hawaii joining the U.S. in 1959 and Disneyland installing Walt Disney's Enchanted Tiki Room in 1963, Americans had all the more reason to indulge in tiki-themed entertainment. However, in spite of tiki's enormous popularity, no cultural phenomenon lasts forever. And by the 1970s, many Americans had lost interest in Tiki's somewhat corny take on hedonism. Americans no longer needed to make believe, because sex, drugs, and rock and roll were readily available. Janis Joplin, Hunter S. Thompson, and Jimi Hendrix drowned out the tropical stylings of Martin Denny, and swinger culture stole the hacky hedonic fire from the Tiki movement. By the 1980s, the Tiki craze characteristic of the mid-century had largely died out. But America's attraction to beachy tiki lifestyles and commodities was far from over. The hard hedonism of the 1960s and 70s had hard consequences, just as every high America felt during the era had a low. Around the latter half of the latter half of the century, Americans were once again ready for something light and beachy, whether they knew it or not. In a single fateful night, an unlikely southerner named Jimmy Buffett wrote the anthem which continues to define the neo-tiki culture. Buffett's semi-autobiographical 1977 hit Margaritaville tells the story of a sponge cake eating alcoholic beach bum contemplating a failed love affair, a heartbreak which the song's narrator eventually blames on himself. 
Margaritaville is a fun novelty song that remains Buffett's most successful solo hit. The song meets every criteria of a one-hit wonder, and one could definitely make the case that it in fact is. But as a testament to America's passion for tropical themed commodities, Margaritaville transcended from an islandy folk song into a full-blown enterprise worth millions of dollars. How could such a thing be possible, you may ask? Well, as far as I can tell, the clearest explanation seems to reside in a faithful adherence to the most basic of economic principles, supply and demand. A principle Buffett learned in the only college business course he ever took. This relatively simple principle has allowed Buffett to become a formidable capitalist. Though Buffett often expresses humility and a sense of irony, he has never let an opportunity pass him by. Wherever he saw knockoff merchandise, Buffett saw an opportunity to legitimately expand his brand. And wherever his presence indirectly drew customers, Buffett saw potential for his own products. Today, well over a dozen products bear the name of Buffett or his hit song. To name a few, Sirius XM's Radio Margaritaville, Jimmy Buffett's Margaritaville restaurants with nearly 30 locations and plans to expand, Mott's Margaritaville Margaritaville Mix, Margaritaville Chicken Wings, Margaritaville Tequila, Margaritaville Men and Women's Apparel, Margaritaville Outdoor Beach Furniture, Margaritaville Frozen Concoction Maker, and more to give a sense of his brand's reach. When I was first contemplating making this video, I was casually drinking a Land Shark beer. As it turns out, this brand of beer is brewed by, you guessed it, the Margaritaville Brewing Company. Aside from his business enterprises, Buffett has also continued to create music. In 2003, after decades as a musician, Buffett won his first award, a CMT award for collaborating with Alan Jackson on It's 5 O'Clock Somewhere. This brief collaboration remains one of Buffett's greatest mainstream successes, yet in spite of achieving such moderate success musically, he manages to sell out enormous venues to his diehard fans called Parrot Heads. Buffett's tours and merch sales are estimated to rack in over $80 million a year. According to Forbes, Buffett is currently worth $550 million. By Forbes' own estimations, Buffett is richer than Elton John, Britney Spears, and Taylor Swift combined, with well over $100 million to spare. Need I remind you that this guy's primary claim to musical fame comes from a single novelty song that peaked at number 14 on the Billboard charts, in 1977. Somewhat annoyingly, Buffett has also seen success as an author. He has written three New York Times bestsellers, the fictional Tales from Margaritaville and Where is Merchant Joe, and his autobiographical A Pirate Looks at 50. Buffett is one of only eight authors to reach number one on the New York Times bestseller list for both fiction and nonfiction. In accomplishing this, he stands alongside literary giants including Ernest Hemingway, John Steinbeck, Dr. Seuss, and Mitch Allblue. In 2009, the animated series South Park released an episode titled Margaritaville, which satirically addressed the ongoing recession. I want to return this Margaritaville. My dad bought it on a payment plan set up by a finance company that got investors from Wall Street who combined it into security sold to the banks who transferred it to you. The episode uses a fictional version of Buffett's Margarita Maker as a metaphor for frivolous spending in America. The episode goes on to encourage personal financial responsibility. This is a possible homage to the song's own narrator and his realizations that his hardship is my own damn fault. The episode received an Emmy and is even addressed in several academic publications. Finally, in 2016, the song Margaritaville was inducted into the Grammy Hall of Fame for its cultural and historical impact, officializing Margaritaville's status as the undisputable most successful one-hit wonder of all time. In all likelihood, this will remain an eternal record. So what makes Jimmy Buffett and Tiki in general so different than other cultural crazes and fads? The answer, for me at least, is not exactly certain. Although it remains a bit of a mystery, it seems that people naturally long for a vision of paradise. From war to prosperity to prosperity corrupted, Western man seems to always have possessed a deep-seated desire to return to Eden. Although this may manifest in indulgent, frivolous, and tacky ways, perhaps once in a while, we owe it to ourselves to take things lightly.